I, I'm excited today because it is Father's Day, and all my kids uh, called me or, and told me Happy Father's Day, and it was such a wonderful thing. And I like, I like being a dad. I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to keep that up for another year. It's a good, it's a good thing. Um, I'm excited to share with you today uh, just one little section of the scriptures with you. It's really practical, and then I'm going to draw some life application out of it. I've got a couple uh, little clips to show you from uh, one of the great movies of all time. And today, the, the verse that I want to share with you is written by a guy named Paul, who was one of Jesus' uh, disciples, and he ends up writing a lot of uh, the books that are in the Bible, and he writes one called Ephesians, based on the name of the town that he writes to. And on most of Paul's letters, he starts off talking about God, who God is, kind of some theology and some understanding of what God has done for us. And by the end of his letters, he almost always gives some practical advice. And I'm glad the church is not just theology without practical ways to implement. Aren't you glad? And so we're going to look at this in in Ephesians chapter 6. Right at the end of his letter, he writes to parents and to fathers. And he says these words, children, obey your parents because you belong to To the Lord. Now, can I just get an amen from every parent in here? That that's a good spot in the Bible, right there. Children obey your parents. In fact, the other day uh, we were doing some work around the house, and I'll get back to the Bible in just a minute. But um, Abby uh, is always at the house and always helping out with cooking and cleaning and doing a lot of stuff. And we were cooking and cleaning. We had a couple different groups over at our house this week, and. We're in the middle, and she's kind of busy, and I'm cooking something. I said, Abby, could you run downstairs and get a fresh thing of paper towels? And she goes, she goes, you know what? I'm going to do it. You know why? I said, why? She goes, because I just read in my Bible this week that it says to do everything without complaining, and I read that you're supposed to obey your parents in the Lord because it pleases God. And I'm like, thank God for a Christian kid in my house. It was awesome. And she went down and got the, she said, a lot nicer than that, but it makes my story better. So... Anyway, there's that. Children, obey your parents. And then it keeps going. This is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. Now, that's in quotes because Paul, who wrote that, is quoting one of the Ten Commandments there. He says, this is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you, uh, and you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, this is where it gets to the dads. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them, but rather bring them up in the discipline and in the instruction that comes from the Lord. Now keep that up on the screen for just a minute, guys. I, I want to just say a couple things here right off the bat. Today, I, I think it's really important that as we look at this scripture, we see that, number one, the Bible is extremely practical. Are you, are you with me on that? Like, it's just, this is how to work out your faith in your life, and I love that. Second thing is, is that as Paul's talking here, uh, he assumes that dads as, have an instinct that we're going to discipline our kids in uh, maybe an overreactive way. I know that I've done that before. Any other dads ever overreacted? Don't leave me hanging. I know that nobody in here is perfect. Come on. And he says this. He says, don't treat your kids in a way that causes them to get hurt and, and create anger inside their spirit, but instead treat them with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. In other words, the way that God's treated us as men and as fathers is the way we need to treat our children. Because, come on, men, God's been good to us. He's been more merciful, more gracious than we deserved. And so since he's treated us that way, that's how we need to learn how to treat our children. And we learn to treat them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, not our own ideas, but the way God has treated us and trained us. And so we're going to dive into kind of what that means today. And the other thing I want to say right off the bat is this, that uh, I've done a lot of different things on Father's Day messages. I've, uh, like, I so appreciated Pastor Lisa sharing about her personal experience. And I preach messages on what it's like to have a, a spiritual father, you know, somebody who's like a mentor in your life. If you don't have a, a good father experience, I preach messages on God's heart as a father towards us. Today, I want to preach just directly to fathers. Is that okay with everybody? Just going to preach right to you as a father. Now, if you're just a dad or you're, I mean, a, a man or you're a single person, if you're a woman in here, I want you to know you can listen in on this. It's going to be good. And actually, what's great is the Bible actually applies to everybody. I have this thought, though. I think that the deepest thing inside of the heart of a father is they want to be a great father. That's what all men want. All fathers want to be an incredible dad. And not all of us know how to do it. But uh, you can apply then the same thing, ladies and single people, like, I want to be a better mother, I want to be a better friend, I want to be a better Christ follower. So it's going to be good for everybody. 
And I'm really thankful for Father's Day because it's the only day of the year that we can get away with memes like this one that I think is so powerful. During labor, the pain is so great that a woman can almost imagine what a man feels like when he has a fever. <laughs> can I get a witness? Come on, somebody. That's, that's good stuff right there. And listen, I get in pain and I get mocked because I didn't have a baby ever, but I, I still feel pain and I want to be acknowledged on Father's Day. It's a good thing. All right. Hey, let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your, your presence that's here. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you we can have a good time. Thank you for the smell of popcorn in church. Come on, somebody. In the name of Jesus, we say thank you. And Lord, I pray that you would change our lives today. Let, let uh, what is said point to you and Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would change us to become better dads, better people, better uh, Christ followers. In your name, Jesus, we say amen. 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 Well, I got some pictures of some movie dads that I thought would just bring, since we're doing NBC at the movies, I want to show you some movie dads. We'll go through these pretty quick, but how many of you remember this guy? He's the guy that taught me a second language. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, then got Mr. Robin Williams. and. He was, a, he was just trying to save his kids, if you remember this movie. If you didn't ever see this movie, you just think, what is Pastor Matt doing? No problem. The next one uh, is this guy. Now, he will fight and kill anybody who messes with his family, kind of like this guy. Then you've got this one here, The Father of the Bride. That is a classic, and I will not watch that for another decade or so, but it was a great movie. He's a great dad. Then you got another one. Ah, oh, come on, one of the best. This is The Pursuit of Happiness, and uh, our brother Will here is just one of the best dads, and I love this story. It's a great, great story. I think we got one more. Do we have one more? Oh, I don't know who slipped that in there. I don't know who put that in there. Luke, I am your father. I didn't put that in there. Somebody of the guys did that for me. Thank you guys for slipping that in there. All right, let me show you some dads of the year in just real life, some uh, dad of the year moments where dads tried to get the kids to look like them. This is for you tech dads of the year. It's copy and paste, which is pretty clever. That's a pretty good tech dad of the year. Next one is our metal dad of the year. Come on, look at the Metallica shirts. And dads, if you can get your children to like your music, you've done a good job in parenting. Can I get a witness? All right, next is the NFL. Wrong bird, but right idea. Start your children young. Okay. Next. Ah, oh, come on, the Fiesta dad. When you're going to go to the party, you dress them up and you start them young. It's going to be great. Then this one is from Hanford, I think, maybe, the NASA nerd. Uh, I'm hoping that guy doesn't show up at church someday, but that's okay. You know, there he is. And then we've got, uh, this is the winner, the Galactic Dad of the Year, Master and Apprentice. I think that wins. Now, I'm going to show you one other Dad of the Year in, in just a moment. It's the Dad of the Year from the movies. That's our, there he is, the central character of our story that we're going to do today. How many of you ever saw Finding Dory? Anybody see that one? What about Finding Nemo? Anybody see that? I'm going to tie a little bit of that in today. This was one of the greatest stories, and this is Charlie. He's a, a blue bug-eyed fish, and he's the dad to Dory, and Dory, his daughter, has short-term memory loss and can't remember things. And if you know anything about the story, she ends up getting lost in the movie, and the whole movie and her whole life is trying to remember where home is and things like that. And this guy is a dad of the year. We'll come back to him in just a little bit. All right. I want to show you a clip from the movie, uh, Finding Dory, but as I do, I want you to understand the setup. It's about uh, Nemo and Marlin from the first movie. They're in the second one, and there's just this great scene that's one of my favorite scenes. Has anybody ever dealt with an awkward person that you meet at the store and they just want to talk to you? You, you don't know them. Has anybody experienced this? Okay, that's this, and so you'll enjoy this. Are you okay? Yeah. What would Dory do now? Who's Dory? Oh, boy. Are we happy to see you? Happy to see me? I'm happy to see you. I haven't had anyone to talk to in years. Years? Wow. Well, unfortunately, we can't stay long. We have to go because... Now, why would you want to go? You just landed. Stay a while. Tell me all about yourself. Well, I would love to, but my son and I have to get to quarantine, so... Wonderful thing to have a son. Oh, yeah, it is. Of course, I don't have a family. I dated a nice scallop for a while. Well, that's fascinating. But, but scallops have eyes, and she was looking for something different. I'm kidding. Well, not about scallops having eyes. They do, and they see into your soul, and they break your heart. Oh, Shelly! Why? Why? Now, what would Dory do? Come with us. Teachable moments right there. Awesome. That's me and my neighbors. 
Ah, uh, no, just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Hey, I've got the title of the message today is this. It's Dad of the Year. Dad of the Year. You like that? Fits? All right. And I've got a surprise for everybody. We, we voted on who Dad of the Year is. We're going to make the announcement right here in second service. Are you all ready for this? Is, can you feel the anticipation? It's me. I won Dad of the Year. I won. I am. That's, come on. Give it up. Go ahead. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. I'm Dad of the Year. <laughs> I, uh, the voting was limited. There was one vote, and it was mine. But I, but I won Dad of the Year. And, and here I'm going to explain it, but it's true. I really am Dad of the Year. Ask me. Um, but the thing is, is that everybody here today, any dads, you have the opportunity to be Dad of the Year as well today. And here's why. I'm Dad of the Year for my kids, Abby and Austin and Nolan and McKenna, and uh, Madeline, is all, I don't know if she's in this service or not, but I, I'm dad of the year to those guys. Be, you know why? They don't have, any, they don't have another dad. That, I'm it. I'm their dad. I'm, I'm it. And so I'm dad of the year for them. Isn't that great? And so let me say this to you dads. You are dad of the year to your kids because they don't have another dad. It's you. And so you can be dad of the year for your kids. Isn't that great? And you're just going to walk out. I'm giving you all a blue ribbon. You're dad of the year. And so we all, we're all winners. It's like four-year-old t-ball. We're all winners today. <laughs> but I want to tell you about the inspiration for this because I actually got inspired for this message back in November. I've been holding on to this message since November. This is not a lie. This is something that's been in my heart. And I've been waiting to share this. And back in November, I was watching one of my favorite TV shows called This Is Us. Anybody watch the show This Is Us? It's a show about a perfect dad, and his name is Jack Pearson. And if you've ever uh, want to watch the show, you can, of course. If you haven't, I'll tell you a little bit about it. But I think we have a picture of Jack Pearson, and there he is. He's handsome. He's uh, emotionally stable. He goes through recovery like a, like a man's man. He builds a business for his family, and he has emotional time to give to each one of his kids a unique em for their unique emotions. He feeds into them as a wonderful dad. He has the right thing to say at every life circumstance that comes at him in this show. Even the episode where he buys the family car, it's so meaningful. When he buys the car, you're just like, oh. <laughs> He bought that car. And then, you know, you realize what an idiot you are for crying, but it's so powerful. And, and he's also the perfect husband, and he's, like, romantic, and he's just passionate about his wife. And I remember watching this show, and this is the honest truth. I'm not making this. I remember watching the show and going, okay, I'm two seasons in, and you're making us all look bad. Like, I'm angry at you, Jack Pearson. Like, you know, you just, you're perfect, and you just do it all well. And I thought, how can anybody compete with this? And how can I can't be like I I, I can't be a, a good husband like that I can't be a good dad like that and I literally was getting angry watching this and as I'm thinking about it the next day I, I was just I remember thinking about it and I had a an epiphany a light bulb moment for myself and I thought this what if I decided that I was going to become the Jack Pearson of my family what if I thought I'm going to become the greatest dad I could be. What if I decided I'm going to become the best husband I could be, and I'm going to spend the next several months until Father's Day becoming dad of the year in my own family? And so I began to do that. I began to start to treat uh, my family a little bit different, think a little bit different. Now, I'm no perfect saint. My family would tell you that. I'll tell you that. But things did begin to shift. After I thought about this and I said in my heart, I'm going to become dad of the year in my own house I remember I was driving home from work and I was going to come into the parking lot uh, or our parking at our house. I have two spots in front of the garage and Lisa parks in one and I park in one. It's mom and dad's spot. And the kids park up on the street. And I remember I parked on the street, called Abby. I said, hey, Abby, when you get home, you can park in the driveway. She goes, how come? I said, because you can be safe and get into the house easier and that's going to be your permanent new spot for your car. She's like, seriously? I said, yeah. And in my head I went, Dad of the year. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm amazing. And then, uh, you know, a couple days later, Abby's like laying on the couch and she's got a blanket all cuddled up and she's got like music going on and she's got the TV on. She's got her phone and she's scrolling. She's like, Dad, can you? And she's like, Dad, are you there? I'm laying down in my bed in the, in the bedroom down the hall. And I'm like, yes. She goes, Dad, would you give me some popcorn in a bowl? And... Uh, I remembered going, you got to be kidding me. Like, my breathing mask is on. And, and then I remembered, I'm dad of the year. 
And so, you know what I did is I was like, yeah, I'm coming. I'm so excited to get you some popcorn. I said, what color bowl do you want? And I put it in the bowl. I brought it over to her. Do you want something to drink? Do you want the little sprinkles, you know? And like, I was like, here you go. She's like, thanks, dad. And I was like, dad of the year. And I just, I'm like living this out. And so like I started to say, yes, I started to think of ways. I thought, how can I bless my son, Nolan? What could I do that would be a big thing that would just make him go that my dad's dad of the year. And what could I do for Austin and McKenna to just sow into their lives and so that they would just go, man, this guy's dad of the year. I started to pretend like there was invisible cameras everywhere I went interviewing to see if I'd make it as dad of the year. And I started to try to live that way because I want to be a better dad anyway. And it began to transform how I was thinking about things. And I love that Tony Robbins and others have said this, but they've said by changing nothing, nothing changes. And and the point of my message, like I don't have some trick ending to this message. The point of this message is this. We can all become better at who we are in our roles in life. We can choose to like, if we parented, let me just say this, dads, you're going to leave here today. We're going to pray for every dad one more time. And you're going to go home with guilt-free dadship. Like you are not going to feel guilty. You're going to go, okay, I might not have been the best dad, but from today forward, I'm not going to make my kids angry. I'm going to do things for them. I'm going to think differently because I'm dad of the year in my kids' life. Isn't that great? How many of you with me on this thing right now? Man, I decided I wasn't going to be passive or inactive in my kids' life. That TV show, I want to show you a clip. There was an interview that I saw uh, with the actor, Milo, uh, who plays the dad, Jack Pearson. And it was pretty powerful about how he can play this role so well. And so I want you to see this. I have a question for Milo. Um, Who's your inspiration for that character or... You know, do you have many inspirations, or how do you kind of fall into that character? Because it, well, I feel like it does touch a lot of people. And here we here we go. You're gonna find me crying, my father. Okay. Ha! Where you at? Oh, there he is. That's my dad. Yeah! Hey! <laughs> um. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so. And my mom is right next to him, too. Yeah. Um, Dan Fogelman, and, you know, by way of John and Glenn and, like, all the producers and writers wrote this man who loves his wife and loves his kids. Really as simple as that. And I saw that. Oh. Ah. oh. <laughs> I saw that with my own father. And there's not a moment in my life that I don't think about how he raised us, my sisters and I, and what he gave me just as a man. So, my dad. You may not have had a dad like that growing up where you had an example. Can I just tell you, that you don't have to have had that in your personal life, in your family tree, to be able to watch other men and other fathers that are doing it right. I'm telling you, there's some great dads in this church. There's some great men of God, some great husbands. And if you go, man, I don't know how to do it, you need to just latch on and go, I need you to mentor me. I don't know how to do it with my kids. I don't know how to discipline. I don't know how to train. My, my kid feels distant. What do I do? I'm telling you, we'll stand with you and we'll help coach you. And I, I'm, no, I'm no perfect man, but I'll tell you what, I love my kids and I want to be the best dad. And I know you do too. That's why you're dad of the year. And you got to not just sit back and go, I never saw it, so I can't. You got to say, I'm going to find it. I'm going to see it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be something better than what was given to me. I'm going to give better than what was given to me. Come on, that's the heart of a father is to do that. I have two theories about men. Uh, And this first one is untested. It's not scientific, but it's my theory. All right, y'all with me on this? I don't know if this is true. I've been rolling this around in my head for a while. I think that men and dads left to our own natural environment without like divine intervention. I think that we might be self-centered. This is my theory. You know what I'm saying? You feel that could, it's possible. Men are like, oh, maybe, you know, like, yes. But 
I think when we come to a place of faith and we begin to see that Jesus laid his life down for others, that begins to have an impact on us. We start to live our life. Listen, when you become a dad, instinctively your life is not about you anymore. And so you start to do that. But the more we embrace that and stop collecting everything for us and start to give things out to others, our children and other people around us, the more you become like Jesus, the more impact you're going to have. And I think you can reverse that trend. My second theory about men is that we learn by watching others do it. If it's changing the, the motor oil on a car, come on, we, we learn by watching somebody else do that. Maybe it's tying a tie, and some of us learned it by watching it on YouTube. Some of us had a friend do it, but we, we got to watch things and see how to do it. You can watch men of God and ask them questions about what they do, and they'll share it. But being a dad without having a good example is a real challenge for some of us. The biggest, uh, Frank Oz, who was the puppeteer behind The Muppet Show, and even did Yoda in uh, Empire and Return of the Jedi. He's, he, he thrilled thousands and millions of children with his puppeteering. But here's what he said. The biggest struggle I have as a dad is to know when it's best to support my grown kids and when it's best to leave them alone. I wish newborns came out of the womb carrying a book, which no wife, woman wants that, but carrying a book that the husband, <laughs> uh, for the husband on how to be a great father. But if we knew, I guess we wouldn't be human. And he relates the human experience that it's tough to be a dad because there's not a manual that tells us how to do it. I, there was a Twitter feed where uh, I read this. It says, my grandpa used to gather us around to tell us stories about surviving World War II. My dad just gathered us around to watch a YouTube clip of a child in Asia playing the song Africa by Toto on a rubber chicken. It's like, you know, like what happened between the generations? Pastor Chris Hodges is uh, the pastor of Highlands Church, and he's the leader of ARC Churches. That we're, we're part of that group, but he's a phenomenal preacher. He said this, people tend to become what the most important people in their lives think they will become. I want you to think about that, dads. I want you to think that what you think about your kids and what you say has tremendous molding ability over your children. And the words that we say, whether you're a father or not, the words you say to people, they can either deteriorate somebody or they can build somebody up. And your words have power. The Bible says that inside our tongues is the power of death and life. And listen, you have the ability to speak life into your kids and the people around you. I'm going to give you just some real practical stuff today. Seven things every dad can do. How many of you are ready for this? Thank you, son. All right, we've got the rest of you. It's going to be good. It's going to be seven things every dad can do. Number one, if you want to be dad of the year, number one thing is improve your own relationship with God. I can tell you this, that you've got to take responsibility for your own spiritual life yourself. You can't blame your past forever as to why you are the way you are. At some point, a dad and a man and a human being has to go, this is who I am, messed up and all, but... I'm going to take responsibility, and I'm not going to keep treating my kids this way. I'm going to start treating them the way God treated me. I'm going to get up to be better. And I'm telling you, the best thing you can do for your family is to get your own heart right with God and in line with him. Go to church, serve on a team, get baptized, go to Connect, go on a mission trip, get involved, read your Bible, pray at your house. When you get the inside things right, you're going to have tremendous impact. I was so moved last week. We did baptisms. It was baptism Sunday for the month last Sunday. And we had, I think, seven people get baptized. Uh, it was a great week and so excited. And we had a dad, Justin, stood up here with his son. He had his arm around him and he said, how can I lead my family where I've never gone myself? My son wants to get baptized. I never did. I'm getting baptized and my son's getting baptized today. I'm telling you, it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen in our entire church to watch this man and his son get baptized. Listen, when you begin to do what's right just because it's right, it begins to have an impact on other people. Yes. Pray over your kids is number two. Pray over your kids. Every day I can do this. Listen, I know I got scenarios all across the board in here. I got blended families, mixed families, um, bullet blender families, like we got nuclear families, <laughs> atomic families. We got them all. Some of you don't have 
direct contact because they've moved out or of a, a, a marriage situation or whatever it is. Can I tell you this? These are seven things every dad can do. You can pray over your kids. I pray specifically over my kids. I take time and I actually pray over each one of them. And I, I, sometimes I take longer and I just go, God, I'm really going to pray over my kids. And you know what? When you don't know what to do, how to relate to your kids, that's a great prayer. God, you're a father in heaven and I don't know what to do or how to pray for my kids, but I want the best for them. And would you teach me how to pray and how to be a good dad? And what should I pray? I'm telling you, God's voice will speak to you and lead you, but you can pray over your kids. And can I say this? In heaven, God is going to hold you responsible for your kids, not me. He's going to hold you responsible for your kids. And uh, it's, the, let me say this, the church is not responsible for how your kids turn out. The, the youth group's not responsible. Our kids' ministry is not responsible for how your kids' spiritual life turns out. You as a family is responsible for your kids' spiritual life. You're going to have to answer. You've got to take ownership of that. A private school, homeschooling, public school. Nobody's responsible for your kids' well-being spiritually. You are. You were given the privilege of your kids, and you've got to pray over your kids with that. Uh, number three is this. Give less criticism and more encouragement to your kids. Now, because of the way men are made, because we're selfish and because we're, like, I tend to be a fixer and I tend to be controlling and, uh, like, I'm just that way. And, and so because of that, when, a, when children tend to do something we don't like, we want to hurl corrections at them sometimes. And sometimes if they're running into the street, you just need to, whatever it takes to get them to stop. But sometimes, now hear me out on this, dads. I'm guilty of this too sometimes. Sometimes we come home and we're trying to parent from the couch by sending commands and it comes out as harsh and criticism. Instead of getting up and giving some encouragement and getting involved with our kids and showing them the right things to do, we need to give less criticism and more encouragement. Now, Pastor Chris Hodges, that I showed you that quote, I watched a video of him uh, teaching some pastors, and he had an interesting story to tell. He said, I'm going to tell this story this year because it happened seven years ago. And he goes, it's about my son. He gave me permission to share it. And his story is that it was Easter weekend coming up, and they had lost a family friend. And when the family friend died, he was a great mentor for Pastor Chris's son. And Pastor Chris's son took that very hard, and it really sent him reeling and there was one time, he said, where he went out with his friends and me and mom didn't check in with him. Where are you going? Who are you going out with? What are you doing? He goes, we let him go and it bit us. We never, it was the one time we didn't check on him. And he went out and he uh, never done this before, but he got drunk. Not plastered drunk, but he said he got drunk and there was other kids in the car and somebody saw it and called the cops. And so late in the morning on Good Friday, after he had preached a couple services in his church, he gets the call to go down to the station or wherever they were at to come and pick up his kid. And he pulls up there to the scene and he can see his son sitting in the back seat of a police car. And the police officer goes to the church and recognizes the dad and goes, oh, I didn't know it was your son. And Pastor Chris said, it's cool. You know, keep him arrested. It'll be good for him. You know, and he said, leave him in there. And, and as he was getting there, another dad was pulling up for one of the other kids. This dad gets out of the car, grabs his son and says, you lousy, no good, this and that. How could you? You lied to us, and I told you, and you've lost your, you're, you can't come back home, and just started laying it into this kid. And Pastor Chris said, man, as a dad, I realize this moment right here is a very critical moment for my relationship long-term with my son. And so he took a breath and thought about what he was going to say. He walks up to the police car, sticks his head down and says, hello, son. He says, son, I want you to know two things. One, I couldn't love you any more right now than any other time. I love you as much as I've ever loved you. And his son goes, thinking he's in big trouble. He says, number two, you need me more now than you have ever needed me at any point in your whole life. <laughs> and he smiled again. His son said, yeah. And his son went to jail for a few mandatory hours and then got out. And his dad said something very powerful to him. Goes and picks him up, and he said, son, what you did there, that's not who you are. And he says, so we're not going to just keep going down that road. I'm going to help you be who you are, which is this. And he says, so it's all forgiven, but we're going to 
live this way because that's who you are. And it was a powerful moment. And his son got on track. And his son is now the young adult pastor at Hillsong Church in Los Angeles and doing phenomenal. And I thought, what a powerful moment. Can I just say that, dads, there are moments where you got to step in with a little bit of, you know, hey, no. But most of the time we could say it like this. Hey, no. <laughs> and I want to, we, our kids need encouragement more than anything. And you got to say that out loud. Can, dads, you're not even saying amen, and that's okay. But can I say this? When you get home today, you need to open your mouth. And I know it's Father's Day for you, but you need to give encouragement to your kids. Tell them what they mean. Say, I appreciate this about you. You're going to be something in life. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to do more for you. We need to say those words out loud. You can say amen right here and now. Amen. Number four is spend more time with your kids. Listen, doesn't matter what scenario you're in. I know I got people in our church, this service and the other two services, that don't have rights to their kids uh, or at least full-time rights. Can I say this? Fathers, it's worth paying the fees, spending the time, doing things right so that you can have more time with your kids. Man, you show your kids that you love them by taking steps forward to more time with them. That's a good and godly thing. That's dad of the year stuff right there. So don't give yourself an excuse. You keep knocking on that wall. You keep doing things right. You keep paying what you got to pay to see your kids more. Dads who have your, your kids in your home, spend more time with your kids. And I don't mean just watching TV with them. Get outside with them. Go and do what they do. Be involved in their lives. Yes. <laughs> when uh, a couple months ago, I realized as I'm working on my dad of the year thing, which, which has gone very well, as you know, uh, kind of had this awareness that Nolan's getting married and he's going to be moving to Los Angeles and, uh, here in a couple months. And I was just kind of like upset about that. Like, oh, man. Like, it's just not going to be the same. And I thought, what would Dad of the Year do? I thought Dad of the Year would spend as much time with him as he could. So we started a thing called Saturdays with Nolan. Like, that's what we do. So on Saturdays <laughs> with Nolan, we go, we'll go to Starbucks every Saturday and just spend time together and just talk about life and what it's like to be a man and how married life's going to be and what are your plans, what are your dreams, and what are you dreaming about, what are you thinking about. And I just spend time some of your kids are going to graduate and just move on, get jobs, get married. Think life happens. You have this time. Spend more time with your kids. Number five is be interested in their interests, not your own interests. This is how to be a great dad. Now I'm giving you, I'm giving you pro tips, people. Pro tips on this. Don't just be interested in what you do. Find out what your kids are interested in. It might be music. It might be video games. And you go, man, I cannot do it. Go sit and watch your kids kill everybody on Fortnite and cheer them on. Come on, somebody. Be involved if they're artists. Be involved if they're into sports. And you go, I never played that or this. Be involved in their interests, not yours. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to break number five down with five separate subpoints because I was a youth pastor for a long time. And I had a lot of dads come to me with their kids. Their daughters were like, 12, 13, and the dads are starting to go, I don't know what to do, uh, you know, and she doesn't talk to me, doesn't want to see me, and I don't feel like I have a relationship with my daughter. And I have five simple tips for dads, especially with daughters. Are you ready, dads? Yeah. Number one, spend regular time with your daughters. Every week or every month, have a set time that is your time with them, like you're going to go do something with your daughter. That's number one. Number two, no correction during that time. That is not your time to fix your daughter. Say amen to that. Come on, you hear me? Number three, go where she wants to go, even if it's the mall. I know, but listen, it's her time. Like Jesus, just lay on the cross for her and die to yourself. Go where she wants to go. You want to go get barbecue and she wants to go get a salad. Try a salad, you know? <laughs> Number four, let her talk about things and really listen with interest in that time frame. Yeah, yeah. This is hard for us men, but this is what works if you want to be dad of the year to your daughters. And the fifth thing is this, hug her. Tell her you love her, that she's beautiful, 
and that you'll always be there for her. And that's how you win your daughter's heart. It's pretty simple, but you got to do it. You can't be passive and think, ah, she just needs to. No, you need to go to her. All right, number six. Speak kindly to and speak well of your children's mother. Now listen, there's stuff all over the Bible. I could just do a whole sermon on this, but let me just say something, men. We do a disservice when we don't speak well of our children's mother. And you know what honor is? It's some of you are like, well, I can be honest. Like she's this and she did that and she did that. Your children don't need to know that. Here's what honor does. That's what the world does in reaction. What a Christian does is they go, I'm going to live with honor. I'm going to find a way to honor. And honor finds the good thing about that person and focuses on that and that alone. And at the very least, you can say, hey, your mom got you to school. Your mom fed you this week. Your mom put, made sure you had clothes on your back. And your mom's a good lady. That's all you got to do. That's honoring. If that's all there is, you can honor that. But speak well of them and their mothers. Number seven. And the final one is this. Set up seashells in their lives. Set up seashells in their life. And I'm going to explain this. I think that as dads, you got to think, you can't play the short game. You got to play the long game. You can't make decisions and cut kids off for one incident and miss out on a lifetime of relationship. So you got to think about the long term and you got to be wise. You got to think that way. And uh, I remember when we, when Austin was in sixth grade, his teacher had a bike riding day that dads and sons could go on a bike ride. So we went, and in Vancouver, that we went on this park that had all these trails and kind of interwoven, and we we're going to go on this tr uh, trail with because uh, the teacher loved to ride bikes and then come back and like have a little barbecue or something. And the thing is, is that there's so many trees on what we call the west side that you can get claustrophobic and get lost just on ordinary streets. Listen, if you've never been to the west side, I want to warn you to never go across the mountains. It's unsafe. <laughs> You can't see very far. It's just, there's too much oxygen. There's a lot of problems with going there. So back there in sixth grade, we went with Todd and Brady. Todd's the dad and Brady. Todd had just gotten through a divorce and he was really panicky and upset about everything. And he didn't want anything to happen to his kids and went through an awful thing. And, and so we go on the bike ride and Todd had hearing loss. And at some point we had gotten all down, the four of us had rode together and got down to the end. But then we came back and all the trails looked different. We're doing our best. Todd's in the front, and then me, then Austin, and then Brady, the son of Todd. And at some point, Brady, we're almost to the end, and Brady's uh, tie, uh, chain starts to come off, and he kind of crashed on side. He says, I'm, he goes, I've fallen or something like that. My chain came off. Well, he yells it, and Austin heard it, and Austin thought that I heard it, but I'm like just paying attention riding my bike. Todd did not hear it. We get out into the open where we're supposed to be, and Todd's like, where's Brady? And Austin's like, well, he yelled and told us he, he, he fell over. His, his uh, chain came off. And Todd went into full-blown panic. I mean, just absolutely terror. And he started just yelling at all the trees, Brady, where are you? And, and Brady couldn't hear us because, again, the trees are evil. And uh, there's just, he couldn't. And so we didn't know where he was. And he couldn't hear any way if Brady would have yelled back. And so I, I grabbed Todd. I said, Todd. We're the three of us. There's three trails here. We're going to each go back the three parts uh, and we're going to find Brady. And we went and I remember finding Brady and helping Brady and walking his bike out. And Todd was there. Can I just say that like there's that sense of panic, but when there's multiple trails, sometimes it's difficult. I want to show you to end the service here. The last uh, one of the final scenes from Finding Dory, the movie and it's really incredible what the dad did and the mom did because they had had a lifetime of missing Dory, but they were setting up seashells just in case. And I think it's a powerful illustration of even if the relationship's broken or distant of what we can do as parents to make it easy and make trails for our kids to have relationship with us. I want you to see this. So sorry. Oh, honey. What? Oh, honey. No, no, no. Cupcake. I know I've got a problem. I know I'm, and I'm so sorry. And all this time I wanted to fix it, and I can't. And, oh, and I try, I try, but my thoughts—they leave my head, and ideas change, and 
I've forgotten you, and I'm so sorry. Dory, 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 don't you dare be sorry. Look, look what you did. What? You found us. That's right. You found us. Honey, honey, why do you think we stayed put here all these years? Because we believed one day you'd find us again. Exactly. But I thought you were gone. How did we you... We went into quarantine to look for you, but you weren't there. Yeah, and we knew you must have gotten out through, through the pipes. Through the pipes. That's right, sweetie. So. And so we did too. And we stayed in this spot. For you ever since. Because because we thought you might come back. So every day we go out and lay out shells. Listen, we are as dads aren't living for ourselves. We're not collecting seashells, we're not trying to build a seashell castle. We need to take what we're given and lay seashells out and make trails, make it easy for our kids to come back into our house, come back into our lives, have more time with us, have relationship. And listen, if you go, man, I don't know what to do right now, you can lay seashells out for your children. You can begin to go, I can do this, I can repair this, I can say I'm sorry, I can fix this, I'm gonna send a note, I'm gonna do this. I'm telling you, if you're intentional, you're dad of the year by just making steps that way, making it easy for your kids when they need you to come back and come back around. Set up seashells. I want you to become dad of the year because your kids are rooting for you to be that in their life. I want to pray for you and with you today. So just close your eyes. Venue two, venue one. We're going to pray together. Jesus, I just thank you. We could gather here today. I thank you, Lord, that in our own lives, you laid out seashells for us to come home to you. I thank you that you're speaking to dads today specifically really speaking to all of us, but God, you're really touching the heart of men who really want to be great dads, great fathers in their lives. And I pray that you would cause us to become more like you and become better fathers. It's our heart cry. God, we're going to set our hearts to do some things differently. 